Welcome to Hemodynamics, and this portion of my discussion is going to be about ventricular tension and the clinical perspective of afterload. I'm Barbara McLean, critical care clinical specialist and expert in hemodynamics. So let's begin. As we know, we always have to cover and renew our understanding of the principles of hemodynamics evaluation. So remembering that we are talking about two separate systems that are intimately entwined, the right and left heart, and that the right and left heart have their own unique methods and their own unique systems. And we divide that into pressures, blood flow, and tissue oxygenation. When we talk about pressures, you'll note on your slide that the pressure in gray and black are differentiating arterial pressure from venous, which then is further divided into systemic and pulmonary. Arterial pressure, resistance to the ventricular ejection, the ventricular bolus of blood that causes the immediate increase in pressure that we consider to be systolic pressure. Systolic pressure measured in the systemic bed as systolic arterial pressure and the pulmonary bed as pulmonary arterial pressure. Venous pressure represents the pressure column when filling a compliant or non-compliant ventricular chamber. The pulmonary venous pressure, commonly known as pulmonary capillary wedge and pulmonary arterial diastolic pressure, or the systemic venous pressure, CVP. Blood flow dynamics are measured by us in two ways at the bedside. First, when we use an arterial-based or pulsatile waveform to evaluate the stroke volume, the amount of blood ejected by every single beat of the left ventricle, very important, Stroke volume is a systemic arterial measurement. Unlike cardiac output, which is a temperature change over time measured in the pulmonary artery. That's why you see that the stroke volume is red and the cardiac output is blue, measured in the pulmonary artery in the deoxygenated blood flow dynamic. And finally, tissue oxygenation. The left heart is delivering oxygenated blood to the cells and removing CO2, and we evaluate basic left heart blood flow delivery of oxygenated blood by the SAO2, the SPO2, and the PaO2. And the right heart is responsible for delivering deoxygenated blood into the lungs for gas exchange. And the measures that we make here actually are telling us about cellular utilization of oxygen, and those measures are SVO2 and SCVO2. Now further enumerating these wonderful similarities and differences, we talk about ventricular filling. Ventricular filling is the time period where the ventricles are in relaxation, they are ultimately compliant, and the volume now will fill those ventricles, generating a pressure column known as the preload pressure or the filling pressure. The right ventricle on diastole fills with deoxygenated blood, and the left ventricle fills with oxygenated blood. We look at the column of pressure, that means as volume flows into a chamber, seeing how that pressure changes for the right ventricle as CVP and for the left ventricle as PAOP or PAD or left atrial pressure. And ventricular ejection, again, lots of similarities. During systole, ventricles eject against resistance via contraction and move that blood flow, move it down the line. That deoxygenated blood is ejected from right ventricle into the pulmonary artery to get it to the alveolar capillary interface to promote reoxygenation. And we measure the right ventricular ejection in the pulmonary artery as systolic pressure. We also evaluate the right ventricular cardiac output, which remember is measured as temperature change over time and is generated with a thermal dilution pulmonary arterial catheter. The oxygenated blood that is ejected into the aorta and out of the left ventricle generates the systolic pressure in the systemic arteries and is a reflection of left ventricular stroke volume. Ha ha, you said, can't I talk about cardiac output from the left ventricular side? Yes, 
but that's calculated. Stroke volume times heart rate will equal left ventricular cardiac output. So when we talk about ejection fraction, ejection fraction actually gives us an idea, a strategic tool to evaluate the competence of the left ventricle and the ejection of the amount of blood divided by the amount of blood that filled the ventricle. So very important for us to appreciate that. Now in history, we measure ejection fraction with an echocardiogram, but we do have catheters that allow us to measure ejection fraction, not necessarily of the left heart, but of the right heart. So when we move from our basic concepts and appreciate that both of our ventricles have diastolic and systolic phases, we move on to talk about that clinical correlation. Now look at this beautiful comparative analysis, our three columns, venous pressure measured either in the atria or the ventricle, looking at the volume that moves from the veins ultimately into the ventricle. Filling pressure reflects volume, ventricular compliance, and valvular integrity. Fabulous methodology. And it looks at the filling of the right ventricle through the pressure column known as the CVP, which is normally four to eight millimeters of mercury. And it reflects the filling of the left ventricle using pulmonary capillary wedge or PA diastolic pressure with a measurement of around eight to 12 millimeters of mercury. Now let's recall that this is just the pressure column that is generated when volume goes from vein to atria to ventricle and promotes filling. Next, we look at ventricular and arterial systolic pressures, which are the reflection of the arterial response to that ventricular bolus, the response of the artery to the ventricular rejection. A couple of things affect that, and we're gonna talk a lot about them in a few minutes. Now. Reflecting that RV ejection, we will see a PA systolic pressure of somewhere between 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. And reflecting the LV ejection, we hope and pray that you're going to see a systolic pressure of 80 to 120 millimeters of mercury. I want to remind you that systolic pressure is representing the acute change in the artery related to the stroke volume. So one of the first things we should be thinking about is when systolic pressure is dropping, do we actually have an adequate ejection of stroke volume? And finally, we talk about arterial diastolic pressure, which tells us about the beautiful tones of the arteries. The systemic arteries are highly capable of both constriction and dilation in appropriate manners related to the presence or absence of hypoxia at the distal end of the arterial system. You have a lot of tone in the systemic arteries. There is much less tone in the pulmonary arteries. They do not have such a high capability as the systemic arteries, but they have a similar property, which is to generate resistance. So what we talk about is that you have a bolus of blood into the artery generating systolic pressure, and the diastolic pressure is the relationship of the volume that remains in the artery in uh, respect to the constant flow, which is diastole. Pulmonary vascular tone reflected by pulmonary diastolic pressure, eight to 15 millimeters of mercury. Systemic vascular tone reflected by systemic arterial vascular pressure, 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. Now we're very worried about that diastolic pressure because that actually helps us to maintain perfusion, but more about that later, so stick with me. Right and left ventricles have different and distinct roles. The right heart is a thin walled muscle it does one-seventh the work of the left heart, and it fills with relatively deoxygenated blood to move it up into the pulmonary vault in order to promote gas exchange. So it fills from the central veins and ejects into the pulmonary vault. This is a very low resistance system, so flow of blood should be quite simple, just really through that right ventricular conduit in the normal physiologic state. The contraction of the right ventricle generates an increase in pressure to bolus that blood into the pulmonary artery, but because there's not much resistance in the pulmonary artery, the right ventricle didn't have to develop a lot of muscle. 
Again, I want to remind you, the right heart actually utilizes about one-seventh of the oxygen delivery through the coronary arteries and does about one-seventh of the work of the left heart. So let's move on to the left heart. The left heart is the mobilizer of blood flow throughout the system. The left heart fills with oxygenated blood from the pulmonary veins. And that system, the pulmonary venous system, is a low resistance, low pressure system, and that has to be maintained. The left ventricle ejects blood through the systemic vault, which is highly resistant and highly variable, shifting all the time and a much longer distance, requiring that the left ventricle has a lot more power. That power to move blood through that resistance system that is very long. If we took all of our vessels out, we'd circle the world eight times around. That's a lot of power to move blood through that system. And that contraction that the left ventricle generates maintains that adequate systemic perfusion, promoting gas exchange at the tissue. The three major factors which affect stroke volume, preload, contractility, and afterload. So we want to remind ourselves, as we talked about in the previous module, that preload is the measurement of the pressure column when volume fills the compliant or resistant chamber. It's about stretch. Contractility is the power to move volume against resistance, and that's about recoil. But what we're talking about in this module is ventricular work the work the ventricle has to perform to eject against resistance. And three major components of that is the vascular tone, the valvular integrity, and of course, the preload that you're moving against the afterload. See how cool that is? Preload, before ejection, afterload, after ejection. So we have three different types of pressures that we measure at the bedside and use to help us drive our interventions in critical care. First, we have the pressures that are measured within the ventricle. Now, normally in the ICU, we're not measuring intraventricular pressures, but those pressures actually tell us about the, the generation of pressure of the ventricle to open the leaving valves, aortic and pulmonic, and tell us about the pressure that is generated when volume fills the ventricle. Now, the only way we see intraventricular pressures, and there really are a couple, first of all, you only see left ventricular pressure in the cath lab. You can see right ventricular pressure while floating a PA catheter, but you may also monitor right ventricular pressure from the pace port of your pulmonary arterial catheter, if you have that catheter, or from right ventricular ejection fraction catheter, what we call the ref ox catheter, where you can monitor right ventricular pressure. So for the majority of people in today's world, we are not monitoring ventricular pressures, but we should. Arterial pressures are the primary active response of the arteries to the ventricular ejection. The response to ventricular ejection actually interrupts the constant flow of blood, which is called diastole. So flow, 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 eject. Flow, 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 eject. Diastole, systole. Very important because that systolic push of blood is what keeps the blood continuously flowing. So we're really interested in maintaining systolic pressure, but not necessarily maintaining that by constricting the vessels, rather, by increasing the stroke volume. And number three, the venous pressure, which primarily reflects ventricular filling, reminding ourselves that the systemic veins return to the right heart through the right atria, and the pulmonary veins return to the left heart through the left atria, and that these are not pulsatile pressures. They are components of pressure change when the atria contracts, pressure change when the AV valve closes, and pressure change when the ventricle ejects and, or contracts and pushes the valve up into the atria. Those are all reflective pressures and they're so incredibly meaningful. Okay, so first and foremost, I think it's really fabulous that at anyone's bedside, 
if we have the ability to look at systolic pressure, and most particularly to look at it continuously because it's ever-changing, systolic pressure represents the response of the artery to a ventricular ejection. So RV ejection into the pulmonary artery, remember, can generate a pressure of around 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. And LV ejection into the systemic artery will generate a pressure in the systemic artery of 80 to 120. Now remember, the ejection and the stroke volume is important, but the tone of the vessel is actually important as well. So that's one of the things that we affect when we use vasodilators or vasoconstrictors, but we should use those always in concert with consideration of what the ventricular ejection is. Now let's talk about diastolic pressure. Diastolic pressure is that continuous runoff of volume through the whole arterial bed and the venous bed. So pushing the arterial flow and the venous flow all the way around the circuit. And that diastolic pressure really reflects vascular tone. Pulmonary vascular tone reflected by PAD or wedge with a pressure of 8 to 15 and systemic vascular tone reflecting the tone of the arteries typically around 60 to 80. Now we know that a lot of conditions affect diastolic pressure and diastolic vascular tone. But I want to remind you of two really important ones, sepsis and metabolic acidosis, in which case, in both cases, we lose vascular tone and diastolic pressure drops. Now that's concerning because diastolic pressure is a major component of mean arterial pressure. Now at the end of the gradient, the resistance pressure to that arterial gradient is ultimately our filling pressure. And our filling pressure is at the end of that blood flow gradient that your ventricle is working against. So if your venous pressures are high, your arterial pressures must be higher and your ventricle must work harder. It's a conundrum and a complexity. So now let's move to the next slide to look at arterial pressure. Taking a look at the arterial waveform is so incredibly important to help us understand the work of the ventricles and the tone of the vessels. And here in this very simple cartoon, what you're seeing is the red line representing systemic arterial pressure and the blue line representing pulmonary arterial pressures. Both arterial pressures, both with a rate of rise to peak, a drop down to a dichrotic notch where the valve closes, and then terminating in diastole. We look at these waveforms with a critical eye to give us information about the difference between systole and diastole, which correlates to pulse pressure, and pulse pressure reflects stroke volume. Now this is so beautiful. Of course it reflects stroke volume because it's actually the stroke volume that engendered the systolic pressure. At the bedside, we talk frequently about the mean arterial pressure, which is very important in terms of maintaining continuous perfusion, but which in general is a mathematic calculation looking at the time spent in systole, the time spent in diastole, adding those two together and dividing them by total time. So at the bedside, our monitors actually calculate that time and they will derive a mean arterial pressure that gives us a very particular number that won't be the same as it is if we are doing a simple calculation on a calculator. But these concepts are so important because the mean pressure is the value which actually helps us to understand continuous perfusion through the lung, and at the cell. So as we look more closely at that beautiful component of systolic pressure, here on your cartoon representing the systolic pressure of 120 for the artery and of 25 for the pulmonary artery, reminding ourselves of the way this looks on a waveform, on a printout waveform over to the right where you are seeing the correlation of the above level, the EKG, the QRS, correlated to the systolic upstroke which follows it. We all know you must have electrical to have mechanical. You can have electrical without mechanical. You can never have mechanical without electrical. But our correlate here is the QRS is correlated to the systolic upstroke 
And that systolic upstroke is the bolus of blood from the ventricle into the artery and reflecting the volume and resistance that has reached the artery and that is engendered by the artery. So now we take a look at the pressure gradient that first your right ventricle must overcome and second we'll look at the left ventricle. And this is such a beautiful portrayal of what your right ventricle is doing. Ejecting blood into the pulmonary artery, so you have pulmonary artery systole and pulmonary artery diastole, and what you're seeing in the circle is the pulmonary artery mean. And that blood flows, it's primarily deoxygenated, flows through the pulmonary capillaries, is exposed to the alveoli, picks up oxygen, releases CO2, and ultimately makes its way to the left atria, who is responsible for filling the left ventricle. So in this dynamic, you can see that the number one goal of mobilizing that blood flow is to promote oxygenation and delivery of blood to the left atria. The first measure is actually the diastolic pressure that must be overcome, and the second measure is the resistance that must be overcome. So we look at first measure as the mean PA, and the second measure as your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. We must be able to overcome that to actually perfuse and mobilize blood flow. So now let's look at it from a left ventricular perspective. Same concepts, but a little bit different values. The left ventricle generates that power and ejects against the systemic artery. Again, you have a circle that is uh, signifying your mean pressure. The mean pressure continues to force that blood all the way through your capillaries into your veins and back into your right atrium to ultimately fill your right ventricle. So the first component of resistance is mean arterial pressure and the second component of resistance is CVP. Huh, MAP minus CVP actually tells us about the resistance circuit. And if we divide that by cardiac output, blood flow over a minute's period of time, that is MAP minus CVP divided by cardiac output. And then we convert that into a resistance measure known as Dines using a factor of 80. So MAP minus CVP divided by cardiac output times 80. That converts this into a measure that you use every day. And that measure is systemic vascular resistance, SVR. But I want to just remind you about being smarter than a fifth grader. That's always my question. If I were to ask a fifth grader, if you were doing a fraction and the denominator went up, what would happen to the end result? It would go down. So I want to make sure to highlight this here, and I'll talk about it again. And that highlight is, when cardiac output goes up in response to tissue demand for oxygen, calculated SVR will go down. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've lost vascular tone. What it means is we must investigate why the cardiac output has gone up. So this lovely cartoon then brings that all back together for us to show us what the right ventricle generates in terms of its systolic pressure to overcome the resistance in the pulmonary artery, which also has a similar, almost exact, systolic pressure. RV systole typically equals PA systole. PA diastole moves that blood through the pulmonary vasculature back to the LA. The LA fills the LV, and the LV must generate enough pressure to move blood out into the systemic arteries. So you see here, the LV has a systolic pressure of 120, and the systemic arteries have a systolic pressure of 120. And in this cartoon, you can certainly see that the RV wall is thin and the LV wall is big. So now on to diastole, my favorite part of discussion because the diastolic pressure sheds so much light on the presence or absence of appropriate vascular tone. When patients vasoconstrict, diastolic pressure goes up, mean arterial pressure goes up, and those two go up quite effectively. Systolic pressure goes up minorly, but if my diastolic pressure is rising, 
and my systolic pressure is not, what that means is I no longer have the ability to bolus blood effectively into the artery. And this is part of what we do when we're titrating vasopressors trying to achieve better vascular tone. Our diastolic pressure goes up, our MAP goes up because it depends on diastole so significantly, but our systolic pressure may stay the same or it may even come down. Caution, that may mean you've limited stroke volume. So diastole, remember, is the continuous passive flow of blood through the arteries and point the capillaries. Because by the way, the only blood flow that matters is the blood flow that gets to the capillaries to deliver oxygen at the cell, to remove CO2 in the lung, and to pick up oxygen in the lung. So arterial diastolic pressure is so profoundly important in achieving and maintaining that blood flow. So just as a reminder, the mean arterial pressure you see here as the green dot for systemic and as the blue line for pulmonary artery, that mean arterial pressure actually is a measurement of area under the curve. And it is calculated based on the peak pressure and the time spent in the cardiac cycle. And mean pressure is what keeps your coronary arteries your cerebral arteries, your renal arteries, oh my goodness, every artery open. We care about the mean pressure because it maintains arterial opening. And when we can maintain our arteries open effectively, we can move blood forward more effectively. So to bring that all together, talking about arterial pressure and vascular tone and ventricular ejection, that comes together in this understanding and the determinant of work. The work the ventricle does to maintain the blood flow. That's what helps us maintain a blood pressure. That's what helps us to deliver blood and oxygen to the system. That's what helps us deliver CO2 back to the lungs and to pick up more oxygen to be delivered to the system. It's a blood flow that goes through a series of valves and there are three major determinants, vascular tone, ventricular work and volume, and the valvular integrity. So first, let's talk about vascular tone. Vascular tone is about the diameter of the chamber of the arteries and the arterial responsiveness to blood flow. Small changes in vessel diameter significantly impact blood flow. Now I'm going to say that again, but in a different way. Every vasopressor, endogenous or exogenous, on a healthy vessel will significantly reduce the diameter of that vessel. And as that vessel diameter is reduced, so will be blood flow. In pursuit of pressure, which is the change in vessel diameter, we may significantly be limiting blood flow. Now, I want to remind you that pulmonary arteries by nature are very compliant. They're highly distendable. They take a big bolus of blood and really short vessels. So they've got to accept a lot of volume and they're quite compliant. Systemic arteries are much less compliant. They have much more resistance to the LV ejection because they have a lot more responsibility. The pulmonary artery only delivers blood flow to the lungs, but the systemic artery deliver blood flow to many, 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 many organs. And what that means is the arteries affected by hormones and other stimulants actually dilate or constrict depending on end organ needs. And there is a method to the madness of our arterial resistance, which is when you have poor blood flow, your arteries actually make the decision under neurologic and hormonal control that it's better to lose your fingers and your feet than it is to lose your heart or your brain. So what happens is that vasoconstrictive response of the arteries actually redirects blood flow away from organs that are not essential, which means not essentially dependent on oxygen, to redirect them to other organs. So we're very happy we have arterial tone, but we must always consider 
that in a critically ill patient, the pursuit of increased vascular tone may limit profoundly your stroke volume, which in the end means reduction in blood flow. Number two, work, work of the ventricle, both internal and external. Internal work is expended in the contraction of the ventricle before any valves are open. So we call that isovolumetric contraction, contracting against itself before valves are open. That's the work and the force that is required to open those valves that separate the arteries from the ventricle, the aortic and the pulmonary valves, the semilunar valves. External work is pressure volume work, which is about transferring blood, pushing volume against resistance. And when resistance is high, your ventricle has to work really harder, but it's inefficient work because the resistance is too high. The converse is also true. When the resistance is too low, the ventricle has to work hard because now there's no resistance, so it just whoo, will bolus out all that volume through an extraordinary contractile mechanism. And number three factor, and so incredibly important, is the integrity of valves. So just about every cardiac patient that you see that has valvular disturbance, they're gonna have an alteration in ventricular work. Now we wanna remind ourselves that two major things can happen to valvular integrity. Number one is stenosis which means valve leaflets are fused together and the hole that once was big, it now is small. And the ventricle has to work hard to push blood through that narrow lumen. That's the stenotic valve. And you can have a stenotic valve at the semilunar valves, which is about the ventricular work, but you can also have stenotic valves at the AV valves, which then affects atrial work. In either case, when the work of the ventricle goes up or when the work of the atria goes up, the compliance of those chambers has gone down and that will ultimately affect forward blood flow. The other aspect is regurgitation. And regurgitation means that you have valves that are no longer firmly seated. And when they're not firmly seated, they're gonna flop in the breeze. And what happens is they permit flow to come back from the artery into the ventricle or back from the ventricle into the atria. Regurgitating valves occur at either semilunar or AV valves. And what ends up happening with this type of valvular disturbance is an over distension of the chamber that is being regurgitated into. So case in point, I have severe aortic regurgitation. My ventricle boluses blood out into the aorta, but the blood in the aorta rushes back into the ventricle by a pressure gradient. That blood now in the ventricle causes the ventricle to stretch and stretch and stretch. And now your ventricle is dysfunctional. So valvular integrity is really important to consider when we talk about ventricular work. Now let's look at a basic Frank Starling curve, and that's going to be on your top right of your slide. And then looking at the lower curve, that's a ventricular function, a vascular function curve. So first the ventricular function, Frank Starling, and below the vascular function curve. And what we're gonna look at here is correlating something that everyone should be thinking about at the bedside. And that is at some point when you increase arterial resistance, the cardiac work will increase, but at some point they uncouple because at some point your stroke volume will start to decrease. So if we look at our top curve, the Frank Starling method, and we're looking at the increasing afterload, you can see that as afterload, resistance load increases, your cardiac output, in this case the index, drops. As your afterload increases, your cardiac output index stroke volume drops. And now the heart is distended and dilated and becomes more and more dysfunctional. So as we look at the bottom curve, what you are seeing here in the vascular function curve is the relationship of the vascular function as it relates to stroke volume. So as stroke volume goes down, 
what you are going to see is a worsening myocardial dysfunction. And as myocardial dysfunction gets worse, afterload will increase. The reason the afterload increases is that it's a compensatory mechanism to a low stroke volume. So in general, we can say there's an inverse relationship between afterload, which is tension, and we talk about that as resistance and work that the relationship between afterload and cardiac output is that when cardiac output goes up, the vessels will dilate to accept the cardiac output and your afterload goes down. Your calculation SVR goes down. When cardiac output goes down, your arteries will constrict and that means that you will have a corresponding resistance evaluation of an increased afterload. Your SVR calculation will go up. But I think very important to reiterate here in this concept is we pursue blood pressure because we must maintain a mean arterial pressure in order to drive perfusion. But at the distal end of that mean pressure, we must look at whether or not cells are appropriately managed. So no calculation is complete without looking at the endpoint of tissue oxygenation. So again, just as a reminder, afterload calculations reflect ventricular work. They don't measure it, they just reflect it. Remind yourself that the pulmonary system is low resistance, and that pulmonary vascular resistance, guess what, is one-seventh of systemic vascular resistance. And if you understand systemic vascular resistance, which is beginning of circuit to end of circuit divided by cardiac output times 80, Nobody is asking you to calculate right now. You also understand pulmonary resistance. Mean PA to wedge divided by cardiac output times 80. Beginning of circuit, end of circuit divided by cardiac output. Pulmonary vascular resistance is low because it's a low resistance circuit. Lots of blood flow, low resistance. Systemic vascular resistance is higher because it's a higher resistance circuit and a longer circuit. SVR is higher, but it's the same blood flow going from the right heart to the pulmonary and the left heart to the system. The difference is the resistance. And the more you have resistance, the more work you've got. When I give you artificial resistance, your ventricles have to work harder. So we want to remind ourselves that the idea of afterload is not a simple calculation, it's a philosophy, it's a theory, it's a means to an end that helps us to support our patients more effectively. Again, to reiterate these beautiful calculations, I have prepared a slide that shows you mean PA minus wedge pressure, if you're not doing a wedge, a PAD, divided by cardiac output times 80. Or if you're talking about system resistance or peripheral resistance, SVR, MAP minus CVP, beginning to end of circuit, divided by cardiac output times 80. That resistance actually puts extraordinary work on our ventricles. And we always have to be sure that our ventricular function is up to the challenge. So afterload calculations are affected by volume and mass of blood ejected from the ventricle, how thick it is, how thin it is, the vascular resistance and the heart valves, the compliance and diameter of the vessels into which that blood is ejected. Are they dilated? Are they constricted? Could we improve heart work by constricting? Could we improve heart work by dilating? An end result is does the blood get to the cell? We calculate this and assume it by pressures. But what we really care about is the pressure as it relates to our flow measure, which is stroke volume. Which means, by the way, if you were a patient under my care and your vasopressors are being titrated upwards, I am always correlating that to your stroke volume. And as soon as your stroke volume starts to drop, I have to figure out another strategy because I do not want to reduce the blood flow in your vessels. So, having said all that, I think it's clear. 
afterload inversely affects cardiac output. The more work, the less work, the resistance, the volume. Afterload refers, the term afterload in the calculation refers to resistance, impedance, and ultimately pressure. It's determined by the ventricle, by the valves, by the vasculature. And when we're at the bedside, we cannot just think afterload is simply about vasoconstriction or vasodilation. That's only one of the four major components of ventricular work and afterload. Now, in our future and in our soon future, and for some of us even in our past, the more calculable measure of work of the ventricles is stroke work index, either right or left stroke work index. And in today's world, what we're seeing is an evolution of another work calculation that gives us tremendous information, cardiac power, CP, and pulmonary artery perfusion index, known as PAPI. And if you stay with me, I'm going to have some discussion about that in the module of contractility. So come on down. Let's all learn together to work harder and more effectively for our patients. Thank you.